Hi, I'm Krista Brisky Richard with the Chicago Park District, and welcome to the eighth season of Night Out in the Park's cultural event series. This year's presentation of cultural experiences will undoubtedly be one to remember, but equally as exceptional as all the rest. For the first time in history of this outdoor arts and culture initiative, we're taking live performances and entertainment from our neighborhood parks into your home. Join us virtually as we travel across the city to enjoy rich cultural performances by some of our city's most talented artists. More than 40 of Chicago's very own arts partners from diverse disciplines will present works, available for you and your family to watch on demand from the comfort of your own home. Thanks to Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, and our newest partner, WTTW, for their continued support. Tune in to watch WTTW's presentation of Night Out in the Parks, The Stars in Your Backyard. The series of broadcast performances will feature 17 of our Night Out performers. Connect with Chicago's rich and cultural scene through our virtual series, Your Night Out at Home. Each week we'll premiere new digital performances by local artists. From dance and jazz to theater and world music, enjoy engaging entertainment in your own backyard, balcony, or living room at www.nightoutintheparks.com. Until we meet again, stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at the park really soon. Eyepieces, eyepieces, get your eyepieces right here, get them while they're hot. Get them in two inch varieties or one and a quarter. Get your filters, get your adapters, get all kinds of accessories for your new telescope. And guess what? We're going to talk about eyepieces in this next segment. Now, you just got your brand new telescope and it came with two different eyepieces, usually a high powered one and a low powered one. We're going to talk about the different types of eyepieces that you can use in your brand new telescope. Here, for example, is a 5 inch Schmidt Cassegrain type telescope. Not a lot of aperture, but it's easy to carry around and it provides some decent images. Now this is useless without an eyepiece. And before me are different types of eyepieces and we're going to go through each one of these and describe its characteristics. Let's talk a little bit about the one and a quarter eyepiece, which would normally come with all telescopes. And these here are your one and a quarter eyepieces. This is a 40 similar to this one, but you see there's a little bit of difference. This is a much chunkier, much heavier type of eyepiece. Usually in telescopes, you'll get an eyepiece just like this one right here. This one also provides wide fields of view, low magnifications, great for star clusters, galaxies, anything that has a wide dispersional field to observe. And then we progress down to the 25, 26, so we get to a 12, and they make them much, much more powerful than this. But a 12 millimeter provides very high magnification and you never want to start out with a very high magnification. You always want to start out with low and then make your way up to high. Now let's concentrate on the two inch eyepieces for this particular segment. From here we have a 56 millimeter eyepiece and that's a pretty tomato sized can type of eyepiece but it's a wide field two inch 56 meter, millimeter eyepiece. Great views, razor sharp edge to edge. Uh, rather expensive, but you gotta, you gotta buy uh, quality, right? And next we have a 40, a 32, a 26, and a two times Barlow. And I can imagine you guys scratching your heads stating, hey, what's a Barlow? Look, it has, it's nothing in that. Well, what a Barlow does is it magnifies the power by two. This happens to be a two-inch Barlow. And all you do is you slip the two-inch eyepiece into the Barlow and then put the Barlow in the telescope. And now instead of a 40 millimeter eyepiece, you have a 20 millimeter eyepiece. Doubles the magnification just like that. And by purchasing a Barlow, you double your eyepiece collection instantaneously. Now eyepieces come in different magnifications and I'm going to share with you what these numbers mean. For example, this is a 40 millimeter eyepiece, meaning 40 millimeters across and very, very wide, wide field of view in this two inch eyepiece. 
And in comparison, this is another two inch eyepiece, same diameter barrel, but this is a 26 millimeter eyepiece. As you can see, in comparison between the two, this has a lot more glass than this one does, but this one magnifies more and has a smaller field of view. Now, you may be asking, well, Joe, what's the difference between a 56 millimeter eyepiece and a 26 millimeter eyepiece? Well, in astronomy, numbers are a little bit backwards. 56 millimeters means low magnification and very wide field of view. Whereas a 26 means a tighter field of view and higher magnification. Well, you know, why don't I just use a high magnification at all times? Well, that's not the way it works. In telescopes, you're looking through a very small field of view. Some people acquainted to looking through a straw. And if you use a high magnification eyepiece right from the start, very difficult to find your objects. What you want to do is start with something very low, very wide field, and it helps you identify and search for your objects much easier. Once you do that, you pop it out, and then you can continue in progression down the higher magnifications until you get your, to your most powerful eyepiece. And it should be dead center in your field of view, and uh, it, it's a great progression of magnification. Now we talked about the Barlow for the two inch eyepiece that doubles your magnification at an instant. Same thing with the one and the quarters. You have your one and a quarter eyepiece, and it also has a Barlow lens. So this one's a three times. So you pop that in and automatically it triples your IP selection because it does it by three times. Every astronomer needs a Barlow lens in your kit. Now with this one I'm really anxious to talk to you about. This is a 80 millimeter shorty refracting telescope. Fantastic wide fields of view, low magnification, and I use this almost exclusively to chase comet Neowise that graced our skies this past summer. And with this, you put in a low power eyepiece, you can even hook up a camera to it, and this rides on top of my much larger telescope, and I can see high magnification images there, and I can take photographs with this one right here. I love it. You would too. Now all good urban astronomers need to find a nice shady spot to enjoy the night sky. Kind of hard, kind of difficult with all these street lights, porch lights, and all of these artificial illuminations going on. But once you do find a nice shaded area out of the direct glare of the street lamp, you need to use a red light like this one right here. Red lights helps to preserve the night vision, and that's what you want. You don't want your eyes to get really, really tight. You want them to relax and open those pupils up, open those beautiful eyes up to the heavens. And if you don't have something like this, I use this almost all the time, get a regular flashlight and put a piece of cellophane over it or a red bag or whatever you may have handy. And it does exactly the same thing. And you can read, you can go after your, your eyepieces, your controls, read your maps. Um, yeah, use a red light. And if you're ever at a public star party, never, never use a regular type of flashlight because this will get you kicked out immediately. Now we're shooting at the Great McKinley Park on Chicago's southwest side. Skies are getting turquoise, my favorite time, and almost time to go and do another astronomy session. Uh, not a cloud in the sky. We got Mars, we got Jupiter, we got Saturn, we got all the summer wonders of, of, the, of the cosmos just waiting to be uh, visited tonight. Now that you've been exploring the urban skies with your pair of binoculars and enjoying what the heavens have to offer, maybe you want to go a little more sophisticated, a little more adventurous. I highly recommend a reflecting type telescope, such as this little baby dog or this larger 8 inch reflector telescope. Both of them will show you a lot more and you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of the, uh, the heavens. Welcome back guys on a nice warm summer evening. Tonight, just by chance, happens to be the, the Perseid meteor shower. It'll peak tonight and tomorrow, but any days between now and next week, you'll be able to see some beautiful meteors in the sky. But we're not here to talk about meteors today. We're here to talk about telescopes and mounts. And your mount and your telescope work hand in hand 
And really guys, your telescope is just as good or bad as the mount that is supporting it. Now there are several types of mounts you can get for your telescope. This is a pretty big telescope, it's a 10 inch reflector, but you may, maybe you want to get something a little smaller, but if you want to do deep space astrophotography, you got to get an equatorial mount, or what we say is an EQ mount, equatorial. What this does is it's powered by a battery and it follows the stars across the heavens. So all you do is punch in the coordinates, set what you want to take a look at, put your camera on the end, voila, you got some beautiful astrophotography. But let's talk a little bit about what makes up a decent, good, solid equatorial mount for your telescopes. When you get an equatorial mount for your telescope, make sure it's a tubular type of design for your legs. Very sturdy, very solid, and it has adjustments down here to level your telescope. Now that you've mounted your main tube on your mount, you got to balance it, and that's what this is all about. If your telescope tube weighs about 15 pounds, you got to add 15 pounds of weight right here on this counterweight shaft. You don't want the motors to work too hard and you want it to balance so it should stay where you leave it in any position and when it does that you're ready to go and you know your telescope is balanced now that you've adjusted your mount to 42 degrees north where chicagoans are usually at right what we want to do is locate the north star or polaris in your polar scope right here and what you do is you bend down, you look, you make little adjustments here and there, and it has a little crosshair. And what you want to do is get that Polaris star as close to that crosshair as you possibly can, or maybe half a degree off, and that's fine, because Polaris is not true north. A little half a degree off. You make your adjustments over here, you, you tweak this over there, and you nudge it into place, and once you do that, tighten everything down, leave it alone, the mount will track your objects throughout the night with little or no attention. Now that you got your brand new telescope, in this case a reflecting type of telescope, all telescopes come with a, re a finder type of telescope. And what this does is it helps you locate the objects in the sky with a much larger field of view, less magnification, and it's got a crosshair right in the middle of the eyepiece. So it's a simple matter of just popping it in, tightening down the little nut, bang you're almost almost ready to go now you got to line the two telescopes together now that you got your finder scope attached to your main tube what you need to do now is to align both telescopes together this is a little telescope that helps the big telescope and it allows you to find celestial objects a lot easier with a wide field of view and low magnification is that what that's what you want on the finder scope what you do during the daytime is find a distant a light pole or tree or building and with your main tube look for it and if you have it centered in here start looking in your finder scope it has a cross here and what you want to do is to manipulate these two little adjustment screws on top and twist them and turn them and twist them and turn them until your object slews right to that center of that cross here keep checking your main scope making sure you didn't bump it or move it and if it's centered here and if it's centered here in that crosshair you are aligned and ready to search for objects in the sky now one of the first things you want to explore with your new telescope is of course the closest neighbor in space the moon now on the average, the moon orbits the Earth at about 250,000 miles. And here we are enjoying a wide field view of a three-quarters moon. But now let's zoom in and let's explore some lunar features in closer detail. And right away, one of the major features that catches our attention is the magnificent crater Copernicus. It's about 93 kilometers in diameter and almost 4 kilometers deep. Pretty big crater. Now Copernicus exhibits a wonderful ejecta ray system, very bright, visible in binoculars and in all telescopes. This crater is named after the famed Polish astronomer 
Nicholas Copernicus, and he's got a buddy. Directly to its uh, upper right, you can see the crater Kepler. This crater was named after Johannes Kepler, the German mathematician and astronomer. Kepler also exhibits a wonderful ejecta ray system, extending out about 300 kilometers, but Copernicus, well, that crater ejecta ray system extends about 800 kilometers. In comparison to Copernicus, Kepler's crater is only about 32 kilometers in diameter, but both of these massive craters were created by asteroids or comet impacts. But let's zoom in on the crater Copernicus and enjoy its striations and its multi-leveled crater edges as we proceed left or west toward the crater Aristophanes at the base of a long, long mountain range. And we're going to go there next. Now here we enjoy a 600 kilometer mountain range called the Apennine Mountains. Some of the peaks reach up to about 5 kilometers in height. Near the top of the uh, mountain range, we have Aristotle and Eudoxus craters and Aristophanes down south. To the left of the mountain range is the Sea of Showers, and to the right, the much larger plain is the Sea of Serenity. Let's say hi to another major feature on the lunar surface, the crater Plato whose basin is lava filled and it's about 101 kilometers in diameter. I have spent many a session watching the mountain peaks surrounding Plato Crater cast their shadows across the smooth plain floor, almost like tiger teeth. To the right you can see the semi-circular feature called the Sea of Rainbows, an extension of the Sea of Showers. Also called Sinus Eridum, the Sea of Rainbows is about oh, 250 kilometers in diameter. And the seas here are pretty young considering the lack of impact craters. And that kids was a quick tour of the lunar surface that anybody can capture with their binoculars or even the simplest of telescopes. Now, even the planets are at your call with a uh, simple telescope. Here is Jupiter. You can clearly see its banding and its kind of squished oblong shape due to its fast rotational period of only 10 hours, you know, in comparison to Earth's 24. So huge is Jupiter that you can fit all the planets inside Jupiter and still have room to spare. And here we have the beautiful planet Saturn with its majestic rings which are only 30 feet thick and Saturn's about a billion miles away, but yet we can grab it with our telescopes and enjoy its ring system. During Chicago Astronomer public observation sessions, people love to see the planet Saturn in my telescopes, enjoying its beautiful ring system, its banding, and you can even uh, count some of its uh, natural satellites, especially Titan, which is a methane world. And all this from under Chicago skies. It's all there. Binary stars, galaxies, star clusters, planets, the lunar surface. And all you need is basic equipment and some knowledge of the sky. And you are there exploring the cosmos. This is Joe Guzman, the Chicago astronomer, wishing you the clearest of skies. And hope to see you at a local park real soon and we can share the heavens together. Thank you.